This is the quadratic functions and their construction tutorial. Now I'm sure you all remember quadratic functions, but just in case you don't, here's a little bit of a refresher. This is your typical quadratic function graphed here on the left. Remember, it makes a parabola, a U-shaped curve. And the function, the generic function that refers to quadratic functions is f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Remember that when a is positive, your graph is going to open upward, like our graph does here. When a is negative, your graph would open downward, like so. You may remember also that there are many transformations that you can make to a quadratic function. For example, if the coefficient a before your x squared term here is greater than 1, you're going to see a compression of your graph. And a compression would be to shrink these sides in. When you bring those sides in of your quadratic function, your quadratic function is going to look more like this. It'll stay, still have the same vertex and axis of symmetry, except now it'll be pressed in a little bit. It'll be compressed. And when that coefficient a is greater than 0 but less than 1, so essentially it's a fraction that is less than 1, you're going to see an expansion. So you're going to see the edges of your quadratic function open up wider like this. And again, your vertex and your axis of symmetry are going to remain the same. You'll just see it expand a little bit on the graph. Now remember, this right here is the vertex of your graph. It's going to be the maximum or the minimum point on your quadratic function, depending on whether or not it opens downward or upward, respectively. And the formula to find your vertex is simply negative b divided by 2a. And remember, your a and your b are defined by your quadratic function. Now to find your axis of symmetry, you're going to use the equation x is equal to negative b over 2a. The axis of symmetry is the axis in which passes through your graph that if you folded one side of your graph over that line, it would lay exactly on top of the other side of the graph. So if I folded the left side over that imaginary line, that axis of symmetry there, it would lay directly on top of the right side of our quadratic function graph here. And lastly, you should recall the discriminant. The discriminant can be written as d is equal to b squared minus 4ac. And remember, what the discriminant tells you is if your discriminant is a positive number, so if it's greater than 0, your graph is going to have two x-intercepts. If your discriminant is equal to 0, the x-intercept is at the vertex. So you're only going to have one x-intercept, and it's going to be at the vertex. That's the case for our particular graph here. The x-intercept, so where we cross the x-axis, or where we touch the x-axis, is also the vertex of our graph. And lastly, if your discriminant is negative or less than zero, there are no x-intercepts, so your graph might look something like this. It would never cross the x-axis, or it could look something like this as well. Now that we've had a little bit of a review of quadratic functions, let's go ahead and take a look at a word problem involving one. In this problem, I'd like you to graph the function g of x is equal to 2x squared plus 6x plus 3. Find the vertex and axis of symmetry of the function. Then determine the domain and range of g. Determine where g is increasing and where it is decreasing. So let's begin by graphing the function g of x is equal to 2x squared plus 6x plus 3. And in order to graph that, I want to find the vertex and the axis of symmetry. To help us find the vertex, I'm going to use this generic function. f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. Where h and k refer to the x and y coordinates of your vertex, respectively. So I want our function here to look like this function here. So in order to do that, I need to find a parenthesis set around this material in the middle. So what's common between these two terms, 2x squared and positive 6x? Well, there's a positive 2 and an x 
common to both of them. I'm just going to pull that positive 2 out. And when we're solving for our vertex, we want to set this problem equal to 0. So when we pull that 2 out, we have x squared plus 3x inside of our parentheses set, plus 3 on the outside. Now the next step to turning this into a perfect square like we have right here is to complete the square. So if you recall the completing the square method, what you want to do is take half of the term here, the coefficient in front of your x, and square that and then add it to both sides. So half of 3 is 1.5 and 1.5 squared is 2.25. So I'm going to add 2.25 right here inside of our parentheses set. And we'll still have that plus 3 at the end. Now, remember, this 2.25 that we added to the right-hand side is in a parentheses set that's being multiplied by 2, which means on the left, we don't add just 2.25, we add twice that, which is 4.5 because really we do have twice 2.25 because in the end it's going to be multiplied by that 2. So we have to make sure that we add the correct amount to the left hand side to balance it out. But again we want 0 on the left so I'm going to get rid of that 4.5 now. I'm going to subtract it off both sides of the equation. When I do that on the left we have 0 again and on the right we're going to have 2 times our parentheses set here, x squared plus 3x plus 2.25. Now 3 minus 4.5 is a negative 1.5, so we're going to subtract 1.5 after that parentheses set. Now I want to take everything in our parentheses set here, and I want to make it look like this perfect square. Now the way you do that with your completing the square method is to simply take x and then add whatever half of this term was originally. So we had used half of that term and squared it to get our constant. Now we just want to add half that term here. And half of 3 is 1.5. Now we just end our parentheses set and we square it. And if you double check your work, x plus 1.5 squared will give you this. Now remember to subtract your 1.5. Now take a look at what we've got here. This function now resembles this function here. Your a term in this case is 2 minus h. So you've got your x minus h here in that parentheses squared. So you want to take the opposite of whatever this value is. We have a positive 1.5, which means our h is going to be negative 1.5. And this is going to refer to our k value here, after the parentheses set. So our k value is also negative 1.5. This is going to be the coordinates of your vertex on your graph. So we want to go over to our graph and plot that, negative 1.5 comma negative 1.5. That's going to be your vertex. Remember that your axis of symmetry is simply x is equal to the x-coordinate of your vertex. So x is equal to negative 1.5 in this case. Now in order to finish graphing this function, we want to use our a value here which is 2. And that tells me that I want to go 2 up from my vertex, so from negative 1.5 up 2 to positive 0.5 on the y-axis. And I want to go 1 to the right and 1 to the left for this particular function. So if I'm at 0 0.5 on the y-axis and negative 1.5 on the x and I go 1 to the right, I'll now be here. And if I went 1 to the left, I'd be here. And you want to continue on from each of these points. You want to go 2 up and 1 over, and you want to go 2 up and 1 over. And when you do that and you connect those points into your parabola, it's going to look something like this. So this is how you would graph that function and how you would find the vertex and axis of symmetry. Now the last part to this question is to determine where g is increasing and where it is decreasing. Well your function is decreasing as you come down here and it's going to be increasing as we go up. Read your function from left to right like you would a book.
Let's go ahead and do one more practice problem. A group of students builds a cannon to launch a bowling ball off the edge of a 25 meter high canyon. They fire the ball at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal at a velocity of 25 meters per second. The quadratic equation that describes the motion of the ball is established below as h of x is equal to negative 32x squared over 25 squared plus x plus 25 where x is the horizontal distance of the bowling ball from the base of the canyon. How far from the base of the cliff will the ball strike the canyon floor, and what will the maximum height of the ball be? One thing that may help you with this problem is to draw a graph. You can use your graphing calculator if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and bring a graph in. So there's a few pieces of information that you should notice about the graph. The first is, this right here represents the ball being fired from the top of the canyon. And you'll notice that that edge of the canyon is 25 meters up on the y-axis. Where it ends up here is the maximum distance that that ball traveled. And the maximum point on our graph is going to end up being the maximum height that the ball reaches. This is why graphing your function can help so much in answering these questions. Because rather than plug everything in to find how far from the base of the cliff will the ball strike the canyon floor, I would have to solve for x in this case in our problem. I would have to set our height equal to 0 because when it's at the base of the canyon floor, it's going to be at 0, and solve for x. Or I could just take a look at our graph here and say that this point occurs at 34 meters from the base of the cliff. So our answer A is going to be 34 meters. And then looking at B, what will the maximum height of the ball be? You want to go ahead and just look at that maximum height here on the graph. And it looks like the ball is going to get to about 30 meters high. So that's going to be the maximum height that the ball will reach. I hope this tutorial has helped to refresh your memory a little bit about what quadratic functions are and how to construct them.